E, herkese tekrar e, merhaba, hoş geldiniz. Teknik problemden dolayı kusura bakmayın biraz bir geciktik. E, Zoom atletini kullanıyoruz. Eğer problem yaşarsanız lütfen buradan mesaj kısmından yazın. E, problemi çözmeye çalışacağız. E, bu arada chat kısmında all panelists and attendees seçebilirsiniz. Sorularınızı diğer katılımcılar da görebilir, cevapları da diğer katılımcılar görebilir. E, bugünkü webinarımızın konusu COVID aracı programı ve COVID aracı programında yapılacak olan yeni değişiklikler. Biliyorsunuz Ekim ayından itibaren COVID aracı aktör atıyor. Yani siz zantıncı adıyla faaliyet göstermeye başlayacak. E, bugünkü webinar e, 9 bölümden oluşan, 9 seriden oluşan webinarlar serisinin ikincisi. E, ve bugün sizlere e, yeni COVID aracı programındaki tüm değişiklikleri e, bilgilendirmeye ve soruları cevaplamaya çalışacağız. E, Webinar, Türkiye Cumhuriyeti ve Avrupa Birliği tarafından ortaklaşa finanse edilen 2020'de Türkiye adlı projenin ikinci fası kapsamında organize ediliyor. Benim projedeki görevim tabi aracı uzmanı olarak çalışmak. Uzun yıllar Avrupa Komisyonu'nda tabi aracı programı özelinde hakem olarak çalıştım ve üçüncüsünde projenin değerlendirilmesinde ve aynı zamanda sözcük projenin yazılması sürecinde bulundum. E, bugün de sizlerle tüm bilgi birikimini paylaşmak için elinden geleni yapacağım. E, bugün bana eşlik eden arkadaşlarım Filip Sovdan ve e, Şeyma Sayın var. E, Filip projemizde Kobi Aracı kişilik uzmanı olarak çalışmakta. Şeyma Hanım da tüm çaktıra Kobi Aracı ulusal irtibat noktası. E, bu webinarın kayıtları, tüm sunumlar ve e, soruların cevaplarını web sitemizde önümüzdeki haftalarda paylaşıyor olacağız sizlerle. E, webinarın sonunda da web sitemiz ve bir tane web sitesiyle ilgili detayları yine paylaşıyor olacağız. E, sorularınızı e, lütfen buradan yazın. E, yalnız 200 küsur kişi katılım gösterdi ve hepsini online cevaplayamayabiliriz. Bu benim için olduğumuz için cevaplamaya e, çalışacağız ama e, gene de cevaplanmayan soruların e, cevapları önümüzdeki haftalarda web sitemizde sizlerle paylaşılıyor olacak. Umarım faydalı bir webinar olur. Ben ve arkadaşlarım sizlerle dediğim gibi tüm bilgi ve deneyimlerimizi paylaşmak için elimizden geleni yapacağız. İkinci sözü TÜİTAK Ulusal İktibak Mutlaka Şeyma Hanım'a devrediyorum. Teşekkür ederim tekrar geldiğiniz için. Merhaba değerli katılımcılar, hoş geldiniz. Ben Şeyma Sayımlar, TÜBİTAK'ta çalışıyorum. Birazcık size TÜBİTAK'ta bu alanda neler yaptığımızı ve yeni katılımcılar için Ufuk 2020 programı nasıl bir program çok özetle biraz bahsetmek istiyorum. Sonrasında Pelip Soldun size programın ayrıntıları ile ilgili bilgiler verecek. Bu Ufuk 2020 programı Avrupa Birliği tarafından yürütülen dünyanın en büyük scientific support programı olarak e, görülüyor. E, Kobi aracı da bunun bir parçası. Genel itibariyle Ufuk 2020'de tematik alanların hakim olduğunu görüyoruz. E, çağrılı e, sistemde çok büyük konsorsiyumlarla katılımda bulunulan e, ve genelde e, temel fikir aşamalarını destekleyen projeler yürütülüyor. E, ama Kobi aracının bunlardan bir farkı var. E, burada konsorsiyum gerekliliği yok. Kobiler tek başına başvuru yapabiliyor, kendi fikirleriyle başvuru yapabiliyorlar ee, ve e, genel itibariyle e, fikir aşamalarını değil, elinizde bir prototip seviyesinde ürününüz, hizmetiniz varsa onu pazara taşımak amacıyla e, destek sağlıyor. E, biz de TÜBİTAK'ta bununla ilgili e, belli... E, hizmetler yürütüyoruz. Ee, Türkiye genelinde e, Ulusal Korne Koordinasyon Ofisi olarak çalışıyoruz. E, bu programın e, e, ulusal çapta duyurulması, e, sizlerin başarıya ulaşması için her türlü rehberliği sağlamaya çalışıyoruz. E, bununla ilgili olarak size küçük bir sunum yapmak istiyorum. E, özür dilerim. <gülüyor> bir saniyenizi rica edeceğim. Ee, 
Şu anda alanda e, Merve Diyar e, ve e, ben iki kişi olarak çalışıyoruz. E, öncelikle şunu belirtmek isterim. Her türlü sorunuz için bize maille, telefonla ulaşabilirsiniz. E, gerektiği takdirde hatta sizlere e, ofisimizde ağırlayabiliriz ayrıntılı sorularınız için. E, genel itibariyle e, ofisimizin e, TÜBİTAK'ta e, Uluslararası İşbirliği Dairesi'nde Avrupa Birliği Çerçeve Programları Ofisi'nin e, yürüttüğü temel çalışmalar şu şekilde. Öncelikle bir web sitemiz var. Bunu kesinlikle e, her şeyden önce ziyaret etmenizi tavsiye ediyorum. Çünkü orada ayrıntılı bilgileri vermeye çalışıyoruz. E, aradığınız her türlü bilgiyi bulabilirsiniz. E, onun ayrıntılarından bahsedeceğim. Gördüğünüz gibi burada e, kim kimdir kısmında her birimizin kontak adreslerine ulaşabilirsiniz. Ufuk 2020 destekleri sekmesinde e, tematik alanlar, kobi aracı dahil diğer bütün alanlarla ilgili bilgilere ulaşabilirsiniz. E, Ufuk 2020 destekleri sekmesini tıkladığınızda burada altında kobi e, hızlandırıcı desteklerini göreceksiniz. E, bu destekleri tıkladığınızda da e, gördüğünüz gibi ayrıntılı olarak bütün bilgilere ulaşabileceksiniz. E, Burada hem e, bu tür e, yaptığımız e, etkinliklerin haberlerini de paylaşıyoruz. Onun dışında e, sağ sekmede göreceksiniz zaten her türlü ayrıntı bilgiyi paylaşıyoruz. E, bunun dışında bir de TÜBİTAN verdiği e, FUK 21 destek ve ödülleri var. E, bunlar da genel kapsamda şu şekilde çalışıyorlar. E, Özellikle konsorsiyumlu başvurular için e, seyahat desteğimiz var. Biz Kobi aracı e, altında daha çok e, koordinatörlü destekleme programı altında destekler veriyoruz. E, bunlar da temel olarak yazdırma desteği, önderlendirme desteği, eğitim desteği destekleri içeriyor. E, projenizi eğer bir uzman kuruluşla birlikte yazmak isterseniz e, öncelikle TÜBİTAK'a bir başvuruda bulunuyorsunuz. E, bu başvuru TÜBİTAK tarafından değerlendiriliyor. Başvuruda değerlendirme kriterleri komisyonunkiyle benzer. E, genel itibariyle komisyona ne sunuyorsanız TÜBİTAK'da onun bir özet niteliğini de başvuru yapmanız gerekiyor. E, orada eğer e, projeniz Ufuk 2020'de bir potansiyel taşıdığı tespit edilirse o zaman biz size bu desteği veriyoruz. Siz uzman kuruluşla anlaşma sağlıyorsunuz. Bize fatura getiriyorsunuz. Parasını biz ödüyoruz. E, bu şekilde destekler yürütüyoruz. E, Merve Hanım'ın ve benim ulaşım e, Kontak e, numaralarımızı burada bulabilirsiniz. E, ayrıca dediğim gibi, başta söylediğim gibi e, eğer dilerseniz e, bir saatlik toplantılar da ayarlayabiliriz. Ofisimizde özellikle e, finans, e, yasal konular gibi konularla ilgili de sıkıntı duyarsanız projenizi yazarken bununla ilgili uzmanlarımızla da görüşme sağlayabiliriz. E, genel itibariyle e, TÜBİTAK olarak verdiğimiz destekler bunlar. E, dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederim. E, şimdilik ben sunumu e, Filip Soldun'a e, devredeceğim. E, ama buradayım. Sorduğunuz sorulara da ayrıca cevap vermeye çalışacağız. Soru cevap seansı da olacak. E, orada yine birlikte olacağız. E, Filip, you're on. Merhaba. Günaydın. Hoş geldiniz. Uh, we're not up to take RT1 standards, but um, apologies for the technical difficulties. But we do know about Horizon 2020. So um, in the next half hour or so, I would like to um, take you through the changes to the program, which will be very important from now onwards, really. Um, and especially as we move into the next framework program, Horizon Europe. Um, I'm using English mainly because my Turkish is minimal. Um, but, of course, any submission to the European Union 
must be in English um, and therefore um, it's easier to give a presentation about their requirements. So, uh, important changes to the SMA instrument. My own background to begin with, um, I have a background in manufacturing in lots of different industries, uh, but my main uh, career activity has been in uh, business support programs for uh, small businesses all over the world, really. Um, and in doing so, I've worked with the European Commission for over 30 years, and it's my pleasure to be key expert on our projects in Turkey. And indeed, I worked on the two earlier projects uh, from 2012. So I've been to a lot of small businesses in Turkey. And I must say, I'm very impressed with what I've seen in terms of high technology, innovation, and the willingness to grow business and to expand into foreign markets. So uh, the content of this morning's webinar, um, just a brief recap really on what the European Commission is and what the SME instrument is. Um, it still exists, but it's under a new name. Um, what we mean by SME, and then uh, we'll look at what's expected of your business, what evaluators look for, um, and basically is it for you? And along the way, we look at the changes being made to the, uh, the whole program. So, a brief recap, look at Accelerator, look at changes. Um, if you do want to look at webinar one, it is on our website. You see it at the bottom there, uh, www.turkeynh2020.eu. And this webinar will also be available in the next few days, along with lots of other information relating to the program the training and the various events that we have done and will be doing over the next two and a half years. So, quick look, what's the EC, Horizon 2020, the SME instrument? Um, often confused between European Union and European Commission. So, a quick recap there, European Union is the union of 28 member countries and the European Commission is the executive body that takes the actions that the European Union decide on, involving, of course, the European Parliament along the way. Uh, 28 member states, as I said, and there are currently five accession states, which, of course, includes, most importantly, Turkey. So let's look at the changes then to the SME instrument. Let's look, first of all, at how it's done so far. Um, over 3,000 companies, and of course, that's growing. Uh, 1.3 billion euros invested, and there's another billion to go, so it's still very active, and a success rate of around 5 to 8%. And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. Why is it there? Um, because I'm sure you've all seen this uh, valley of death, as it's called, um, in the innovation circles. Uh, you begin with public funding, which uh, can help to grow research. Um, as you get into development, there's less funding available and the private sector is not very interested in funding you because of the risks involved. As the project begins to prove itself, um, you then have the interest initially of angel investors who might put small amounts in to, uh, to, to grow the project, and then into venture capitalists who perhaps put more in and then, of course, you're into industrialization and even stock market uh, quotations. So the middle bit there, the development, the important part between taking expensive research and converting it into commercial products, which, of course, produce taxation, jobs, investment, and lots of other things, uh, the important bit is, to some extent, missing. And this is where the uh, SME instrument, or accelerator, as it will be called, um, moves in um, and is there to invest up to 3 million euros in projects to help get them off the ground. So again, looking at your own projects and products and ideas, um, you're looking at the investment in development, the research side, there are other commission funding for research, and of course there's national funding as well. And I must say, in looking at other countries, I've worked in over 35 countries, um, looking at Turkey, I think it's one of the best setups for investment in innovation, research and technology. Um, you have 65 science parks, you have over 7,000 high technology companies. Um, and as I said earlier, some of those 
um, I found to be very impressive on an international standard. So let's look at what stays the same, first of all, with the SME instrument. Um, we have the um, uh, definition, really, of what is an SME. So it goes from one um, up to 250. So it covers most companies, in fact, um, in the, uh, the range. And like most countries, Turkey has around 95, 97% SMEs. Um, so they're very important uh, for the creation of jobs, for the growth of wealth, and of course for uh, taxation revenue. So one to 250 is the range. And there is also up to 50 million turnover. That may seem a very high figure, but of course, in the days of automation, you may have a steel works with less than 250 employees and the turnover way in excess of 50 million. So that's why it's there as one of the controls. Uh, Horizon 2020 has three pillars. I mentioned earlier there could be funding for science. Uh, pillar one is excellent science. This is funding that goes mainly through universities and institutions and supplements national funding. Uh, national investment in research. At the other end, pillar three, societal challenges. This is looking at health issues, the challenges of old age, of disability, of migration of populations, all societal challenges. And the central part there, industrial leadership, is where uh, the program sits, the SME innovation instrument with around three billion spend. The overall horizon budget, by the way, is something like 85 billion euros over a five year period, and that will increase on the new program. So it shows that the European Union is firmly behind the idea that research and innovation um, are the future to industrial growth. So, six key, key difficult to say even in English, six key criteria remain um, the need for a demonstration of cross. Um, coverage in projects, the need for high growth businesses, and then a grouping together close to market, disruptive, scalable, and at the prototype stage. And I shall now deal with each of those in turn. Um, Cross-border, of course, it's investment from the European Union, from the 28 countries and the accession countries who contribute towards the funding of Horizon 2020. Uh, Turkey, of course, contributes um, a 50-50 deal with the European Commission. So if you are claiming funding from Horizon, half of that funding is coming from the Turkish government. So relevant to Europe, the growth of European innovation, jobs, knowledge, um, and you need to analyze target markets if you're talking of cross-border projects. A lot of companies I see say, oh, we're going to export to Europe. Um, I say again, Europe is 28 countries, lots of different languages, cultures, stage of development, competition. So don't say we're going to export to Europe, look within Europe and don't go for the obvious choices. Um, none of those countries speak Turkish, some speak English, Turkish speak English. So again, you're looking at the restriction even through language. So looking at target markets, looking at competitors, you can do lots on the internet, but actually going there, going to a trade show, talking to people in the market, all of those things give reality to what you're looking at. And of course, the project must fit with European goals. Um, European goals are to grow the economy of Europe. It's one of three major trading blocks after the Americas and the Far East. And uh, the importance there of the growth of Europe, uh, 360 million people. So the market size compares equally with uh, America and it's slightly smaller than the Far East. Um, but it is an important trading block and the reason behind the whole union and economic union. So what do we mean by high growth? Again, lots of people have different ideas. The OECD defines a high growth business as a firm of 10 or more employees that grows either its employees or turnover by an average of more than 20% per year for three consecutive years. Sounds very technical, but um, you're looking there at a very high level of growth. So the potential for high growth um, as a result of the, the project that you're seeking funding for um, is taken into account and is very important. So let's look at the four related criteria. Um, all of this translates to 
a technology readiness level, TRL6 or above. Now, a lot is talked about TRL, so this is going to be more important on the um, uh, future Horizon Europe. And um, TRL then was something that was invented, I think, originally by NASA. So 50th anniversary of the moon landing this week, it shows that um, it's over 60 years ago that this idea was created and is still used, so there must be something in it. So we're looking at TRL level six and above. So technology readiness levels are going to be even more important under accelerator. So the closer look then, um, this is the list of them. It goes from zero to nine. Um, you see on the right side of the screen there that some of them are grouped under the original idea. Um, and then we move into prototype, uh, then into validation and finally into production. So. TRL zero, the idea, an unproven concept, no testing performed. Um, a lot of people have what they consider to be a clever idea and then sit back and say, so who's going to give me money then to grow this idea? The world isn't like that. You have to show it's a good idea, uh, prove it's a good idea, and show that you can actually convert it into something useful and saleable. technical issues there. There we are. Um, your excellent idea should be disruptive. This is another term that we hear a lot. Uh, the idea has to be disruptive. I've covered this previously, but a recap. Uh, innovation, there are three general types of innovation. Incremental, these are small changes which influence market share and the progressive advance of a product. Generally speaking, European Commission are not interested in incremental change. These are small changes in the marketplace and they're done at the level of competition. The next one then, step change, more significant changes by adding new technology to give a major market lead. The Commission begin to get more interested with step change, but you have to convince them that uh, it's a major step change which will grow markets and increase um, the company's turnover. Disruptive is what they really want, of course. They're very difficult to find. They don't come up very often, but when they do, they can change the world. So disruptive creates new markets and value networks by disrupting the existing ones. Uh, by way of demonstration, the, the camera was around for years. It had a roll film. It was simply a lens with a shutter, and it worked well for over 100 years. Um, there were some incremental changes by adding flash guns and light meters. Uh, this gave market lead over some camera producers compared to others. And then, of course, there was a step change. We had the electronic pocket camera, much more compact, and you could transmit the pictures into your computer and move them around with Photoshop and other things. The real disruptive technology, of course, none of the camera companies saw happening, and that was the mobile phone. And the mobile phone now is quite firmly the means of taking photographs, you can transmit them through the network, you can upload them, you can even upload it yourself on some, some phone. So it's become a personal communication device now rather than a telephone. And indeed, with some of the modern telephones, it's difficult to find how to actually make a call. So disruptive is what they're after. So TRL1, the basic research, you can describe the needs but you have no quantified evidence. So you're beginning now to define and you're establishing need and potential impact. These are crucial to EC funding. All the way through the Horizon program, they're looking at need. Define a need, quantify a need, show the need, and then show what impact will be made by your product satisfying that need. So you see there very early on, we're not at TRL6, we're at TRL1, but you're looking at need and you're looking at potential impact. Without those, TRL6 um, isn't going to happen. TRL2, technology formulation, okay, you've had the idea, you've looked at the markets, you've now got the concept down, and you're beginning to work out the technology. You need, of course, to validate that with your customers, you have an initial offering, and the stakeholders like your idea. So you have now customers who are saying, this looks good, we might be willing to buy it, to produce it, um, and we're interested. Four, the small-scale small prototype environment. So this is something that's built 
in the laboratory, so-called Oakley prototype or an alpha version. This in fact is the first ever Apple computer. It's the one that Steve Jobs built in his garage as the first Apple in 1976. So it shows that a disruptive technology can grow into one of the world's largest companies within the lifetime of the founder. So you then move into five, TRL5, which is the large scale prototype. So here is the second version of that computer uh, tested in the intended environment. So this is something more serious that can be useful, but not yet in the form for mass production. So here we move now into the area that the commission are interested in, TRL6, where you have a prototype, it's tested in the intended environment, the prototype is close to the expected performance, and you see now that Steve Jobs has something that could sit in an office. Um, this is the uh, version two, uh, which is the pre-production version. So it's tested, it's working, and it's ready for growth. This is where criteria five, if you remember our six criteria come in, the scalable one. Um, this is where you're, you're demonstrating through your submission to the commission that you have an ambition to significantly scale up production to move from the prototype that we've just seen into mass sales. Uh, it could be your own production, it could be production under license, or it could be a joint venture. Again, we've seen many companies who are basically research companies who've come up with a clever idea and they've got to TRL6 level and you say, well, what will you do with it now? And they say, we're going to make it. And you say, well, do you know anything about factories, about production? Do you have the 10, 20 million euros needed to go into large scale production? Um, I think you have to be aware that if you're a research company, this is your main field. So yes, you can go into your own production, but you should also look at producing under license, joint venture, or indeed to, to sell the ideas to the highest bidder and move your uh, profits into research into more areas. So they're all options to be considered. TRL7 then to finish off is the demonstration system. The, the computer is operating in a working environment, which is a particularly untidy one, um, at a pre-commercial scale. So you're almost ready now to say go with production. At this point, you're looking at some very expensive production either being done for you, or as I say, setting up a factory with plastic moldings, electronic uh, boards, uh, screens, and lots of other things. TRL8, you're in the market. You have the first commercial system. Uh, all the technical processes and systems to support commercial activity are in a ready state. So there we are, we're still with our Apple computer. Uh, it's amazing how old fashioned these things look compared to a modern computer. And this is within 30 or so years. So first of a kind is there. And then finally, TRL9, the full commercial application where the technology is on general availability for all consumers. So sorry to have dwelt on those a little bit, but it's important to see the different stages and to see where the important things come in, particularly uh, the earlier need and impact, which precedes many of the stages that the companies we uh, deal with in Turkey have gone through. Uh, in some cases, um, the countries have had what they consider to be um, a clever idea, which fits with their uh, abilities as researchers, and they haven't really considered the need, and they simply think of the impact. It must be good. It must have a market. But you have to prove that with European Commission funding. So it all looks the same so far. So what are the changes that are coming in now um, through Horizon Europe? Uh, Horizon 2020 will run to the 31st of December 2020, and Horizon Europe will then run for six years. Uh, this will be, I think, the ninth framework program. Um, so they've been doing this for approaching 50 years. The Horizon 2020 had a very high budget, 77 billion. That rose, in fact, to over 80. Uh, Horizon Europe already has a budget earmarked of 94 billion. So again, you see the Commission are keen, I should say the uh, European Union, are keen to invest in research and innovation. So the SMA instrument gets a new name. Um, there is now a European Innovation Council. They have a pilot and they've created Accelerator. So this is a name that you'll see. The SME instrument isn't a name, it's just a vehicle. 
um, accelerator is the name for that vehicle. The same basic, basic logic, um, they're dealing with the lack of finance for breakthrough and disruptive innovators, startups, SMEs, entrepreneurs, that remains the same. Um, they estimate, they being uh, the commission estimates a total equity funding gap of 70 billion euros. So this is what they're trying to build. Um, many small businesses, and I'm sure a lot of our uh, participants this morning can confirm this, they can't find the high risk capital needed to get to private investor stage. Accelerator bridges that gap in finance and risk taking. This risk taking thing is most important to Accelerator. Um, the commission don't see themselves as uh, dabbling in the commercial funding market. They're looking to fund the risky aspects of projects to get them to a point where the private sector uh, are willing to invest. So they're actually looking for a risk, but of course must, must uh, be confident that if those risks are overcome, there will be a market for the product or process we're looking at. Um, as before, the three key aspects of proposals and projects, but what impact do they make? Can they demonstrate technical and innovative excellence? And how will it be implemented? What will be the quality and efficiency of implementation? The company must show high growth potential, um, high risk, I've already talked about applicants, disruptive innovations I've mentioned, and sound business plans. Again, in many of the companies we've seen, there isn't a business plan, or if there is, it's rather sketchy and there's no strategy for the future. If you can't demonstrate that your project fits in with your business plan, uh, then I'm afraid that you're on the losing wicket. You must show that you have a business plan and that this project fits in with it. Uh, on the award criteria, when we look at excellence, does your project have high innovation potential beyond the state of the art? Impact, does your project meet the pressing needs of European and global markets? And implementation, does the project have a coherent and efficient work plan? Now, remember that the uh, competition for acceleration for Horizon 2020 generally is very high. So it's a matter of how much you can win on these aspects rather than simply satisfying uh, these headings. You must show excellence in them in order to stand a chance of funding above the other competition. So some major shifts under Accelerator, um, a greater emphasis on commercialization. It was already very high and there's an even greater emphasis um, and even more emphasis on the impact that your project will make. They're looking for the winners basically and this is two measures. There are no thematic areas so you can apply with any sort of project um, there's no thematic coverage, calls are open. The Commission have looked at simplifying the whole system. So they've done away with thematic areas, they've done away with calls against particular uh, technologies. Uh, the calls are open, uh, but um, they, they close uh, every uh, three months or so in order to look at the proposals. So there are dates where you have to apply, uh, but they're not closed calls. Great involvement in private sector financing. Um, again, this is seen as extending the Commission's funding um, and getting the private sector involved in what are sound commercial ideas. So larger amounts of funding potentially from the private sector. But the European Commission will also invest venture capital. They'll have a venture capital special purpose vehicle, as they're calling it, that will be named some sort of fund, I'm sure, to invest in projects, again, to invest in the risky part of projects that will um, then get it into private sector financing. So they see the programme of supporting SMEs which need one last push before scaling up to market-ready products. And longer term, we can see that there's a move from grants towards equity investments. So why EC investment? Uh, we're not in uh, the logic of making money. What we need is to take risks where the private sector will not. This is a statement from the Commission. Um, and interestingly, the comment at the bottom from Julian Guerrier, the Director of the Executive Agency for SME Enterprises, the public investment's failure 
is the measure of success. If we were to succeed disproportionately, it would mean that we simply displaced the private investment. So you can see that they're looking to uh, not replace private investment, to, to supplement it, to uh, uh, get over the risky aspect. So who'll be offered what? Uh, phase one grants, which were under the SME instrument, will disappear after the 5th of September. Now, some people bemoan the fact that phase one is disappearing. Um, it was seen as very useful to take a look at the market and to uh, move on to the phase two projects, which then seek uh, deeper investment. Uh, why is it disappearing? Uh, my own feeling is that it was probably um, costing more to operate than it was worth and that those funds are better spent in the larger projects. Uh, I can't, of course, speak for the Commission, but that's how it seems. Uh, the Phase 2 grant support, up to 2.5 million euros, will be available to projects, as I said, at TRL level 6, 7 and 8. There's also a new vehicle, Blended Finance, offered to projects at 6, 7 and 8. So this is a combination of grant, EC investment and private sector. More of that in a second. Private sector and uh, EC equity will only be offered at projects in TRL 9. So these are the ones which are going into large scale production. Um, private sector mainly, but again, a little bit of EC investment if it's needed to get over the final risks. Phase three stays as before with lots of coaching and mentoring available to uh, companies who are using the program. So, we're in that area, 6789, that we talked about earlier. Uh, the blend of finance, this is a new development uh, to get more, more engagement with private sector, as I said, and make better use of EC funding. Investments of up to 15 million euros, so very large investments there. Um, and the special purpose vehicle I've already covered, which the uh, Commission will introduce um, for investments from, um, from the public funding. Any income that the EC gets from equity investment will be put back into the program to fund further projects. So they're not banking any profits that they get from such investment. It can look very complex to begin with, and it's certainly worth looking into it. Um, when applicants apply for funding, uh, they have the option of ticking a box on the proposal submission to say whether they're prepared to consider blended finance if it's offered. Um, if no, uh, they may be offered a straight grant, but if the application is rejected, uh, there will be no move to blended finance. So you're making a key decision to begin with um, to uh, decide whether blended finance is for you. The European Commission will consider all the applications for suitability for blended finance if they've ticked the box. Um, and if they consider it suitable, they'll decide on the financing mechanism to be offered. So this may be a combination of grant or EC investment or private sector um, or any one or two of those. So there's a real uh, uh, complication there of what can be offered, but uh, rather than complication, I think it actually gives you more options um, to get the finance that's right for you in your project. So let's look at that in a bit more detail because it can seem quite confusing. Um, we're talking of TRL levels 6, 7, 8 and 9. And if you look at the risk in those projects, the risk is greater the lower the TRL number. So 6 is the riskiest and then the risk begins to thin out as we go up to level 9. Still some risk at 9. But remember, these are not fixed stages. When you go into level 6, you're only just getting into the uh, prototype system. And by the end of level 6, you're ready to move into the larger scale uh, prototype. So that's the risk. If you look at finance, the private sector interest grows as the number gets higher. So by level nine, they're very interested. Uh, level six, not that interested. So here's the combination of finance uh, that comes in. The EC grant um, is more available at six than it is by the time you get up to eight. And in fact, it wouldn't be available for nine. If you look at private sector, they're interested, very little interest at six, and it grows as we get to nine. And the gap you see there is where the EC venture capital will come in to make up the gap between the risk and the interest of private sector. 
So what are the chances then at each of those levels? If you look at level six, uh, the chance of getting an EC grant is higher. Uh, there's a moderate chance of VC funding and the private sector venture capital is low. If we then look at level seven, um, the EC grant, chance of an EC grant is lower, uh, higher for the venture capital, and the chance of private sector is moderate. They're beginning to get interested. By the time we get to level eight, not much chance of an EC grant at that level, um, and a lower chance of EC venture capital, but a higher chance of private sector. And then as we come to the final stage, there will be no EC grants, they've said this, um, but the chance of venture capital from the EC is also lower, and of course from private sector very high. So you see there across the spread how it moves from grant support to uh, public risk capital, and then eventually through to private sector risk capital. So TRL will be far more important. It's essential to actually correctly assess your TRL uh, because this will be the key to the type of funding you'll be offered. Um, as I said at the beginning of the application <coughs> submission, the applicants agree to consider blended finance if the evaluators conclude that the project is suitable. Excuse me. Uh, the investment part will be subject to due diligence by the special purpose vehicle team, the European Commission's team, uh, and or the private sector, depending on the uh, blend of finance that you're offered. What do we mean by due diligence? I'm sure you've come across this before, but this is an investigation taken before um, the financiers enter into an agreement or a contract. So they're looking there at reviewing the product, the market, the customers, um, assessing the accounts, uh, looking for any evidence of fraud or malpractice because that would uh, immediately say no to investment. Um, they're looking at the debts of the company, the actual turnover, the profits, the assets. Um, I've been involved in due diligence of uh, company purchase and I can tell you it's very thorough. Uh, on the basis of that, there is a decision whether you can work with that company and whether it's worth investing in. Um, just as importantly, though, you're looking at the management team. Somebody said you, you back the jockey, not the horse. Um, you're looking at the management team, whether you're confident, whether you can work with them, whether you think they can make a success of the business. So again, you're looking for a blend of skills. It's not all about technologists. Many businesses, of course, are founded by technologists, but you're looking for a commercial approach. You're looking for some sort of financial involvement and marketing, a good blend across the management team, and one that works together cohesively. This incidentally also comes in um, if you are asked to pitch for funding with the commission, they're looking very closely at the management team who are making that pitch for funding. Um, you also, of course, look at the patents and who owns those patents. Um, the company should own the patents if you're looking to uh, get someone to invest in the business. It's unlikely you get investment if the patents are owned by someone else because of course they can control whether the company produce or not and of course the ownership who owns what who's the majority shareholder if there are any and what the basis of ownership is so lots of checks there to give confidence that investments will be safe and expectations will be realized that there's a good chance um, of minimal risk if equity investors are involved um, you get more cash, but as I've just said, there's greater scrutiny. Uh, there's a greater adherence to milestones and results. You can't say vaguely, well, we expect to have this done by the end of the year. They'll be looking for dates. They'll be looking for progress meetings, milestones, and promised results occurring at those milestones. Why? Because time is money, and they're seeking to get a return on their investment according to the agreement that you've made with them. So there's pressure for the return to be achieved quickly, um, and many investors will want to be involved in the management of the company. It's a big chunk of their money, they want to be involved in board meetings, and may want to be appointed directors or take a share of ownership. But it means that you'll be quicker to market, it means that you'll have a more commercial approach because you have outside involvement, that you'll finish up with a more saleable company or product more quickly, and that you'll have the possibility of getting more investment uh, because you've proven 
uh, that you are a worthy company to be invested in and hopefully have made the promised returns. The application process is virtually the same as before. The um, orange areas, yellow areas are new to the program. So you have to apply online before the deadline. Uh, this is a very strict commission rule and it goes down to a hundredth of a second even in terms of the timing. Try and make it earlier than the deadline because as you get towards a deadline, the system overloads, becomes slower, and if you have any problems, you can lose the uh, actual submission. This will go to a uh, one-stop shop, which will decide on the best route across the EU agencies. So it could be you've applied for your accelerator, uh, but it may be that there are other funding areas that could be uh, more relevant, and they will tell you this. As before, all the applications are assessed by independent evaluators, and uh, they will, they have a system of scoring, they are more independent, they're in various countries, there are Turkish evaluators, um, and there's a whole system behind that of scoring to find the best uh, projects to invest in. Um, they're all assessed for future economic impact uh, for market creation, the TRL level, uh, they will take a view on your TRL level, so there's no fooling them in the sense of uh, trying to pretend that the TRL level is higher or lower. Uh, there'll be questions about that. Um, and of course, they're looking for a business plan that will take the project forward. So the applicants with the highest scores are invited to pitch before all, and the offer there will either be a grant, which we should be informed about within a month, and the grant made within five months, um, or you'll be offered this blended finance model, uh, again informed within a month, and the grant within five months, if there's a grant element to it, but the due diligence could delay um, the um, actual full funding uh, for some time longer, depending how long it takes to do the due diligence and uh, whether there are any questions arising. If there is blended finance and the due diligence says it's not worth investing, then the Commission will withdraw the grant application. So it's worth remembering if you're going down that route, uh, you should be quite sure that um, your company's sound and investments are likely to be made. Just to look at the pitching process, um, this is the, the process as it stands. There's a 15 minute briefing of the jury about your proposal, a 30 minute interview, and then a 15 minute debriefing afterwards. And the juries then get together, from the juries across the uh, whole panel, uh, to agree on the list of projects proposed for funding. So you actually have a score from the evaluators um, between 13 and 15, um, and you then have an A or B from the jury, depending on whether uh, they think it's worth supporting or not. So is it for you? Is it for your business? Of course, it's only for you to decide. Um, of course, the essential thing is that you're an SME, I'm sure you all are. Um, and have you successfully commercialized a product before? That really helps if you've gone through this process. In terms of the project, again, we're back to the, the need, what customers, what market needs will the project solve? Do you have evidence? Do you, can you quantify it? Have you simply done a web search or have you done a proper look at customers and potential markets? Uh, the commission, of course, and the evaluators see lots of rather glib statements on uh, markets. And if you see something that says, you know, the, the world market for this is 7 billion, and in the first two years, we're going to get 5% market share. Of course, it's a nonsense. You need to actually quantify the market and uh, show how you're going to perform. Is the project innovative? We've covered this, disruptive. Is it about the current state of the art or is it simply following what's already out there? Again, in some of our interviews, companies have told us about their product. Uh, we've looked on the web as we've been talking and we found similar products. Now, it may be new to Turkey, it may be new to the world, but it's important that you get this right. Does the project have the potential to disrupt the market? We've talked about that a lot. Is it TRL6 and the bug? The management team, I stress the importance of the management team, are they on board with the project? There's no point in saying to a junior, here's some European money, go off and write a proposal and I'll sign it and send it. The management team have to be engaged 
in the whole process, otherwise it will not get very far, and that means the commitment of time and money to make this submission. You have to be behind it. Is the intellectual property protection clear, and is there a strategy in place for how that will be transferred within the company, perhaps from individuals? Do you have a good idea of cost? Have you worked this out? Um, and if you are offered blended finance, are you prepared to allow for external investment, due diligence, and perhaps the involvement of other people in your business? Again, the framework program supports external, but many companies have not looked internally. How capable is the business of taking advice on board and taking action? Quite often we see that products are the, the baby of the inventor and any criticism is not welcome. Um, you have to be able to take advice and to take action and to understand that advice. If you're a scientist and somebody is talking to you about the construct of finance, uh, not being rude to scientists, but it can be an area that you're not familiar with. And you know, if you're not, then you need support in those areas. You can't run a whole business uh, completely by yourself. Uh, you can't do it effectively anyway. The staff that are involved in proposal writing, are they trained in proposal writing? Have they ever written a proposal before? Uh, we had an event recently where I asked this question, a proposal writing training event, has anyone ever written a commercial proposal? And out of 40 people, two said they had. It's important that you have the background so that you can actually uh, project your company uh, commercially and make the right sort of marketing sounds and noises, say the right things. Proposals are in English, uh, unfortunate though that may be for some countries. Uh, how are the language skills in the business? If you don't have the skills, can you take external advice and have it read through to improve the language? It's not a huge cost and it can make the difference. External review, it's always helpful if you have a friend who knows something of the uh, business or even better, someone who's not a friend because they'll tend to be more blunt with you, um, you get an external view and see you know, whether it makes sense. Often in proposals, you feature on the things that you know about and you tend to gloss over things that you don't. But when you read a proposal, if you like, as an external reviewer, um, it's fairly easy to see. But if you've made a big chunk of stuff about technology, um, it, show, it doesn't show how clever you are at technology, it shows how weak you are at the areas that you haven't put much, much effort in. So it has a, an opposite effect if you're not careful. And finally, do the management team give enough time and priority um, to this important program? What accelerators not, it is not an easy option. You can see from the last uh, half hour or so, it's quite tough to get funding, uh, some substantial funding, and it will really take your company forward if you, get, uh, if you are successful in winning it, but it's not an easy option. And it's certainly not for companies with no clear strategy or business plan. Um, they soon fall by the wayside if that's the case. It's not for pursuing academic research. There are other funding areas for that, both within the European Commission and nationally and from other sources. So it's not for pursuing or continuing academic research. It's not for companies with no clear knowledge of market and customer needs. I've said so often you need to stress the uh, knowledge of the need and the impact. And it must be driven by the commercial potential over any fascination with technology. And so many companies are fascinated with technology but do not have the commercial approach. And although that may be useful in winning funding for the scientific or the technical side of things, it will not win um, the European funding. Other elements of the pilot, just quickly, there are other funding elements within the pilot. There's a pathfinder pilot for future and emerging technologies. Again, sizable grants for collaborative interdisciplinary research. Um, there are targeted calls in this case on particular topics. There are three examples, artificial intelligence, zero emission, of course, climate change is very important, um, implantable autonomous devices and so forth. Uh, again, you need a consortium of at least three organizations from three countries in order to apply for that. The fast track to innovation, this is for mature groundbreaking technologies, so technologies which are well proven, uh, but need to take in further into the market. Again, grants of three million euros and consortia of three to five entities 
from three different countries. And finally, Horizon Prizes. Um, this is for uh, breakthrough innovation across sectors and fosters cutting edge solutions. Some hefty prizes there, five to 10 million euro. Um, and uh, all of these are uh, freely uh, available on the website if you want to look further. The European Commission's website for Europa, as well as our own. A health warning, um, the pilot is a pilot and it may be subject to change already. There have been changes since it was announced and I'm sure there may be others before the full adoption in 2021. The equity investment aspect has yet to be finalized. Rules, EFAS, levels of participation. You can imagine the complexities of using public finance for venture capital. Um, the SPV hasn't yet got a name, special purpose vehicle. Um, it will be given a name, I'm sure. The submission dates and budgets do vary, so always check um, if you're heading for a submission date um, that you have the right date, it can move. Um, often it moves uh, further into the future. Uh, always check online and or with Tubitac to get the current information. So the project that we represent today, Turkey in Horizon 2020, is there to help. Uh, there's a whole range of courses to help achieve more success in terms of project writing, uh, proposal writing camps, which look at actual proposals. Um, there's one going on this week. Um, company specific training on proposal writing, the webinars, of which this is the second today, uh, pitching workshops, how to pitch to the EU, um, enhanced proposal writing for some companies who almost made it with a seal of excellence, um, investment readiness training, lots of events. We had a very large brokerage event in Istanbul recently with over 500 people attending. There's another one in Brussels later in the year. We have missions to other countries to see how other countries work on the Horizon 2020. Um, and we also support innovation, try again, information multipliers in universities. Uh, there's a network of 100 uh, individuals in universities and other agencies um, who are there to help and inform SMEs about Horizon 2020. Um, why, why does Turkey participate in Horizon 2020? Interesting uh, question, uh, one I can't deal with politically, but just looking at the benefits of participation, um, it's not just about cash, it's about sharing, it's about being involved in other European technology, other European research areas, finding partners, uh, getting to know about impending regulations, uh, accessing to different standards, different academia, new markets. There's a whole range of things that come alongside uh, the funding, which is usually the main focus of companies, um, all leading, of course, to economic and social development. It's about creating and maintaining jobs, new products, bigger market share, new markets, uh, and, of course, increasing revenue from taxation. So it's cooperation that complements the impact of national investment in these areas. As I said earlier, I think Turkey has done particularly well at investing in these areas and the Horizon 2020 is there to supplement that work. So, uh, thank you for participating. I hope you found it of interest. Um, as I said earlier, you'll find this webinar and the previous one on our website um, in the next few days. Um, we're here to deal with your questions. Many of them have been coming in. Um, the webinar will remain open for the next 40 minutes or so. So if you have questions, send them in. Um, you have the contact for Tubitac. You have our website. Um, so we're there to help. And if you can help at all, we'll be delighted to do so. Um, talk to Shekla for listening to me. And uh, I'll see you now what sort of questions have been coming in whilst I've been talking. Uh, there, by the way, is our, uh, our website and our contact details. So uh, we'll leave that running um, during the questions. And we're back to the uh, TV production now as we switch over from one to another uh, gingerly. So, um, Yasmin, do we have any questions that are of interest to everyone out there? You can read the questions and answers, of course. but. Um, have we got any that are particularly relevant? Mm, 
There was a question about the due diligence. One of the participants asked if they should share their own due diligence report while they are making their proposal. Don't have to share your due diligence because due diligence is actually to assess the value of your company. Because if you would like to get a blend of financing from the European Commission and if you would like to get some private investment, then the European Commission will have a due diligence of your company and they will uh, value your company and they will ask you a share in terms of your request for private investment. So no, the answer is, you don't have to share your own due diligence, but just try to give a proper information on your team, on your previous experiences, on your network, on your tangible and intangible assets, while introducing your company. Okay. Uh, and there is another question, I think this should be answered maybe by our NCP. It's about to take games. Uh, for now, we are planning to keep the games, of course. Sorry, okay. <laughs> uh, for now, we are planning to keep uh, the grants uh, for the, I mean, prizes for about threshold and for the success. Uh, so, yes, there will be also a prize for X Rater. Uh, what constitutes high technology? Um, interesting question. Uh, given that the proposals will be considered by a team of evaluators who will be from business and technical backgrounds, I suppose it's high in comparison to existing technology in the sector um, and particularly existing European technology. So it's a very broad description, I know. Uh, but this is part of the um, review that you should be making in markets to see what level of technology exists already in the market and how your uh, proposed high technology compares. Okay, any more questions? There is another one. Uh, I also. Sorry, I'm again. Um, there was another one. Uh, I also tried to answer this, but I can tell it now also. Uh, we have seen some examples like that. Uh, for example, one of our companies uh, used uh, a, a little bit known technology. It was new technology, but it was not that um, disruptional innovation, okay? Uh, but they use it in a very... Uh, specific segment of uh, the market so they get uh, the phase one with this project because uh, it was clearly smart uh, in these uh, segments of the market it was needed they saw this need it is very important to see to try to you know uh, seize the needs of the markets uh, all the time because this uh, grants are all about markets how how you see the market how you see the needs of the market how you try to um, find solutions to these needs in pains in the market so uh, it is a good idea if you see a, an opportunity in a market that never nobody sees you should definitely try to use it. So, if you uh, if there is a, a known technology, but you should adapt it to this market in a way that nobody does before. Uh, it must uh, contain a little bit of innovation because you will adapt to this market. There will be a little bit changes, but uh, the important thing that you see the need in the market so you uh, just combine together markets and the technology it is also an innovation so yes it is a good idea if you just try to write it properly of course Aston. company did grow less than 20 percent for last three years and applying for a new product that they have grown to child seven and can we have a chance to have a grant? 
Yes, of course. Uh, this is no criteria that you have to grow 20% in the last three years. Uh, it was just the definition of a growing company, but there is no such criteria. There are startups who don't have any revenue or who have really less revenue and who are awarded. It all depends on the innovative level of your product and if there is a big market and if you have the capacity to commercialize your product in the international market. So yes, you can have a chance. Um, I say again though, it, it's a competition. So the closer you can show to high growth, the better chance. But as Yasmin quite rightly says, um, the startups are included. Um, it's the excellence of the idea and the disruptiveness which will attract them. But if you can also demonstrate your high growth, that will give you an advantage over someone who doesn't. Uh, there's another question. Uh, do we have a chance to apply for uh to start in Horizon with the same project. Uh, if you apply to the same uh, with the same program to two different institutions, you cannot fund the same uh, expenditures uh, from different institutions because it will be double funding. But if you have a, a project and you apply to both institutions and you fund different uh, items, budget items, I think it's uh, eligible, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm this. Um, uh, in general, uh, Tubitax supports uh, are generally supporting uh, until the uh, SM instrument and the name name of accelerator. Uh, when you apply to TADEP's uh, grants, uh, they are generally getting you through all the phases with the idea to the prot prototype. Once you have the prototype, now you can apply to uh, Accelerator. Uh, generally, this is what we um, recommend uh, to companies because uh, in this way, you are a little bit used to uh, prepare a project and also now you are ready for the accelerator because now you have a prototype. But uh, in the trans transition phase, there is a little bit of gap about the commercialization idea. Uh, because we generally, uh, there is a, a question about coming mista common mistakes. I will find these two questions together. Uh, we generally see uh, our companies are maybe excellent about your innovation, about their idea, about their project in technical part, but they uh, have difficulties to see how they will commercialize their project in the European or global market. This is uh, the key point of this grant. So uh, first, maybe you should uh, try uh, to gain perspective about this and try to search a little bit about uh, the global market, the European market, what are the trends uh, in your section, in your sector, uh, where is it going and uh, what is happening there, what are the innovations uh, in, in this market. So uh, you will have a clear sight uh, where you are standing uh, as your innovation and in the place of the market. So uh, from there you can make uh, much more successful strategies uh, because in this grant uh, not only innovation or technical part in, is important. They mostly look how you will go to market with this idea, with this project. This is the most important part. So your first focus should be on the commercialization part. Uh, you, will, you will have to search all the market opportunities uh, and uh, the market analysis, uh, competitor analysis. Uh, when you do all of these, you will uh, have to uh, make a strategy how you will enter the market and then penetrate. Uh, after the penetration, how you will spread and how will you get to your targets uh, who are your targets exactly and are they willing to buy your uh, products and uh, is there a demand really uh, maybe you foreseen this demand but you have to provide some um, some kind of uh, you know uh, perceiving um, effects so uh, generally uh, the mistakes we see that this commercialization part 
are weak, a little bit weak with our companies. Uh, maybe Yasemin would like to add something to this question, to this question. I think the biggest uh, common mistake that's made is uh, companies are focusing too much in their technology instead of their commercialization strategy. It's an innovation project, so instead of uh, focusing too much on uh, your technology, you have to convince evaluators that you will be able to commercialize your product in global markets. Uh, I think this is the biggest mistake. Um, yes. And there's one more question. It uh, says, if the tenth industry has a different approach to commercialization, will the EC take into consideration products that are only designed for specific customers, which is still cutting edge, scalable, suitable for mass production? First of all, the defense projects are not eligible to be funded by a European Union grants. There is no defense project that's eligible to be funded, so it shouldn't be in defense. But if your product is uh, implementable in a relevant uh, industry sector, like uh, maybe um, security, it shouldn't be designed only for a specific customer, even if it is still cutting edge or disruptive. Then if you have a specific customer, then uh, your customer should be maybe funding you. Uh, because the European Union is uh, expecting the product to be useful for as many people as possible so if you are uh, aiming just on specific customers then your chances of being funded will be very low just to um, add to that one um, if you look at the ideals of the european union the aims of the european union um, they have a whole range of issues as i pointed in the pillars that are uh, societal issues so you, you may have software which is there say for education but um, if you can angle it towards perhaps helping people with dementia people who are excluded socially people who are perhaps the uh, subjects of migration and are trying to learn a language or a culture all of these things can help to sell what may be um, seen as rather basic and uh, software which could be available in other places. So early learning, uh, as I say, medical issues, society issues, uh, there are lots of different angles to take. And of course, very uh, crucial areas to Europe, um, the carbon capture, the climate change. As we see today, temperatures of over 40 degrees in Paris, you know, climate change is with us, and uh, anything which will help uh, to resolve some of those issues um, would be you know, more, of more interest to the evaluators. Any more questions? Yeah, there is one more. Uh, I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, it's from English, but I can't really understand what you are trying to mean. Did you get this question? <laughs> I didn't understand it. Yeah. But we're strugg struggling here with uh, technology at times, two different languages, so bear with us if we can't fully understand. Okay. Maybe you can so ask in Turkish. Questions. Yeah, maybe. You can ask your question in Turkish. Yes, yeah, we, can, we can answer in Turkish. We're all <laughs> uh, for the last question, we had a project and prototype we used a fund from COSGAP and it's a commercial as well in local market, but we want to take part in global market. Yes, of course, you can apply for H2020, um, especially in um, now, uh, as Philip told you, uh, the investment uh, blended finance option uh, will enter uh, and, um, for example, uh, as far as I can understand, now you are in uh, TRL 8 or something, is that right? If it's so, you can apply for some investments uh, for the blended finance. Uh, you can say that you are already commercializing 
uh, your product, but you have to be uh, in the global market. So, of course, you will have to first search for the global markets. Uh, as I told you before, uh, you should make a nice analysis about it, it and then uh, build up a strategy to enter the global market. Uh, because uh, as for the global market, you have to put some uh, innovation there. Still, uh, at the general aid, you will have to uh, put something new in the global market. So if you can show that, of course, you can apply for uh, H2020 uh, accelerator uh, in this uh, TRL8, uh, maybe for investments. Blended finance comes in in application, I think it's up to the 5th of September, so it comes in a little later this autumn. So you have time to consider those markets and how you might apply the blended finance. Any more questions? No. I, I did get a question on uh, property. Um, if you do enter into a pri private financial agreement, who owns the intellectual property? Uh, the simple answer is that the intellectual property should be owned by the company, and therefore the ownership of that property is then shared by the shareholders. So it can't be an individual within a company, it needs to be the company. It then becomes an asset of that company, which is part of the financial deal. Uh, there's a question in Turkish. Can I respond in Turkish? Thank you. We're in Turkey. <laughs> E, medikal sektörde emis olarak nasıl projelerimiz var ve e, TLT desteklerinden faydalanıyor, faydalanıyorsunuz zaten. E, tabii ki bu çalışmalar ile e, H20 ile desteklerinden de faydalanabilirsiniz. Şeyma Hanım bahsetti. TÜBİTAK ya da KOKYEP gibi kurumlar genelde projeleri, profesör sanatına kadar destekleyen konulardır. Halbuki e, senin istiyorsunuz, yani yeni adıyla aktörlerator dediğimiz program, Prototipten ticarileştirmeye kadar olan aşamalara destek veren bir program. Aslında birbirini tamamlayıcı projeler. O yüzden tüm takla bir aşamaya getireceğiniz projenizde SME Instrument ya da yeni adıyla aktörlerator programına başvurmakta herhangi bir hafta yok. Başvurdu. Hmm. Hmm. Şey bilir. Bir diagnostik olarak yüksek teknoloji dediğimiz kısma daha zor olmadığımızı ee, tabii ki medikal ya da bu tarz e, e, sizin çalıştığınız alan yüksek teknoloji olarak adlandırılan bir alan. E, o yüzden e, o konuda da problem yaşamazsınız. E, hatta daha çok desteklenen projelere baktığımızda e, çoğunluğunda istatistiksel olarak medikal alandaki projelerin e, daha yüksek olduğunu da görmekteyiz. Hmm. The mobile phone is a commercial product, but say a satellite can also be commercial products that solve some issues, how people are cutting edge, may even be destructive if more people choose to use it, but only would be produced on demand. May they, uh, may they be suitable for accelerator? Well, it's a challenging question. Uh, generally, uh, European Commission uh, in the program are for scalable products uh, because uh, thing as they will uh, make an invest on you and they want you to grow up so in this case uh, if your uh, market segment is very small uh, it is not uh, possible to grow really large uh, as your company and also for the project so they are generally looking for a little bit bigger market shares, uh, bigger market segments. Uh, but um, maybe there might be a case that uh, you are doing something really marvelous. I don't know uh, what's your project, but I'm just uh, hypothesizing. Uh, really something marvelous and very attracting. And uh, if you can put up uh, a strategy, uh, you know, to uh, show people how how, uh, is, how well is your project, and maybe if you, you can put up a strategy that uh, spread more uh, than uh, maybe even guessed, there might be a chance, but I can't say something certain about your case. Would you like to say a few words about uh, Philip? I think... Um, 
Yes, a, a, a satellite is one object, but something that has a, an enormous range of functions. A communication satellite handles hundreds of thousands of calls um, in, you know, in seconds. So it, it's, um, it, it's a benefit to a large number of people, but the purchase of that satellite might be you know, six or eight telecom companies. So you're showing the benefit to Europe or even the world as a whole through a, a communication satellite. Um, the example I can think of, the um, UK has a national lottery, like so many uh, countries. The national lottery actually um, bought a satellite which is about the size of a, uh, a Mercedes van, uh, the B, I think it's called, um, quite a large one. It had to be launched uh, in its own rocket, Ariane. Often they take several satellites to cut down the cost of launch. Um, and this was purely to handle the communications for the National Lottery through the various ticket outlets. It was secure and of course it cuts down on telecom charges. Um, that satellite paid for itself within a year and yet it was tens of millions of euros to build and launch it. So you can see there the benefits uh, outweigh the costs even on something as singular uh, and complicated as a satellite. So, uh, yes, few users of satellite, but many beneficiaries from satellites. And a good idea, of course, the mobile phone, I mean, that originally began with Nokia, who were a timber company. Um, they created the mobile phone so that their lumberjacks could communicate with each other um, using the local aerials. And it grew like, uh, like Topsy, and indeed Nokia grew to be a very large company. Um, but then again, they lost sight. Uh, when you began with multifunction phones, uh, they stuck with uh, voice communication. Um, still around today, but not the size or market share that they had. So, um, you know, if a thing has a use, um, the market will soon follow. It's a matter of proving it. Any more questions? Take a short English. Yeah, I don't think so. I think we are done with the questions. Okay. A few words uh, about the new program um, in Turkish, maybe. Um, şunu belirtmek istiyorum. Şimdi bu yeni programla ilgili olarak genelde hani neden böyle bir değişiklik yapıldığı merak ediliyor. Ee, Avrupa Komisyonu'nun şöyle bir hedefi var. Ee, şu anda e, Avrupa'da hakikaten iyi araştırmalar yapılıyor, iyi fikirler üretiliyor ama bunların pazara taşınma konusunda e, ciddi bir eksiklik, bir boşluk olduğu görülüyor. Amerika'daki gibi olmadığı. Yani ekosistem biraz şu anda Amerika'ya benzetmeye çalışıyor. Yaptığı sistem de aslında Amerika'daki sistemi biraz burada Avrupa'da uygulamaya çalışmak. Dolayısıyla e, burada temel e, hedef e, fikirlerin pazara taşınması. Fikirlerin hem de güçlü bir şekilde pazara taşınması. Yani yarın kaybolacak bir şekilde değil, arkası da gelecek ve büyüyebilecek bir şekilde. Dolayısıyla bu işe böyle baktığınız zaman aslında genel olarak bu projelerin e, hedefini e, daha iyi kavramış olabilirsiniz. Çünkü e, genelde akademik çalışmalardan e, buraya geçildiği için e, bu vizyonu belki geliştirmek hemen e, hızlı ve kolay olmayabiliyor. Bunun için bir hani perspektif olarak söylüyorum bunu. E, aynı düzlemde e, bu blended finance seçeneğinin eklenmesi de e, artık e, sonuçta e, sürekli hibe vererek ve kısıtlı bir hibe vererek e, bu ekosistemin geliştirilemeyeceğini gördüğü için komisyon şu anda bir deneme olarak e, yatırımcıları da bu işe çekmek istiyor. Aslında temel amacı yatırımcılarla COBİ'leri buluşturmak. Dolayısıyla e, şunu görüyoruz bazen e, COBİ'lerin yatırıma çok sıcak bakmadığını işte işime karışılacak, belki de işte benim elime kontrol edilecek endişesiyle çok bu işe sıcak bakmadıklarını görebiliyoruz. Ama böyle düşünülmemesini tavsiye ediyoruz. Zaten komisyonun kimsenin işine karışmak gibi bir amacı yok. Bunu sık sık belirtiyor komisyon. Ve genel olarak yatırımcılar da zaten çok iyi gördükleri ekibi, çok iyi gördükleri işi alıp da bozmak istemezler, daha iyi bir yere getirmek isterler. Isterler. Dolayısıyla bu ekosistemde bir yer almak istiyorsak e, nihai olarak bu yatırımcılara bakış açımızı belki de biraz değiştirmemiz lazım. Bunlara biraz daha sıcak bakmayı öğrenmemiz lazım. Nihayetinde e, gerçekten ortaya inovatif bir şey koy, koyuyorsak e, Türkiye olarak biz bunu Avrupa pazarında global pazarda görmek hus hususunda gerçekten çok heyecan duyuyoruz. Yani 
E, bunu çok hissediyorum. E, dolayısıyla bu ekosisteme ayak uydurmadığımız sürece e, bu konuda biraz daha, biraz daha, biraz daha geriye düşmüş olacağız. E, dolayısıyla biraz daha e, open-minded olmaya davet ediyoruz sizleri. E, i̇kinci olarak da şunu belirtmek istiyorum. E, takımınızı güçlendirmek e, faz 2 kapsamında artık çok daha önemli bir hale geldi. E, dolayısıyla e, projeleri yazarken e, takım kısmında da ciddi bir şekilde eğilmeniz gerekecek. Özellikle e, bu işi yürüten e, sabit bir CEO olması bu CEO'nun o alanda çok e, hani kendini belki ispatlamış kadar iddialı demesek de tecrübeli olması e, ve ekibin de kalın işleri hakikaten e, dengeli bir şekilde dağıtılmış olması gerekiyor. E, ve sonrasında işiniz büyüdükçe yani scale ettikçe e, ona uygun da bir büyüme planı ortaya koymanız gerekiyor. Yani e, işiniz büyüdükçe sizin ekibiniz de büyümeli ve dolayısıyla böyle bir planınız olduğunu da eklemeniz gerekiyor. E, bu tür noktaları da dikkat ettiğiniz takdirde çünkü artık faz 1 kapanıyor ve faz 2 üzerinden gidecek program tamamen faz 2'ye yoğunlaşmak durumundayız hep beraber. E, o yüzden bu bağlamda e, bahsettiğim hususlara dikkat edilirse daha başarılı projeler çıkacağına inanıyorum. No questions coming in. Yes. For a draft project application as a reference for our preparation. Uh, The, all the successful projects are confidential, so unfortunately we cannot share any proposal uh, template with you, right? Uh, there is one document we are sharing with you. Uh, step by step, they are telling about how you can prepare a good project. This is prepared by uh, EIC uh, NCP project. Uh, if you would like to see it, we can share with you. Just please send me uh, an email uh, to the email address uh, I've shown you at the first time in my presentation. If you can send me some email regarding this issue, I can send you all these documents. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, very much asked. Uh, to see a draft. Of course, there is no draft, but this document is nearly a draft. It is a, a very nice document. I like it. It's a very useful document. Uh, we're, we're often asked, uh, can we see a successful pro proposal, and then in brackets, so that we can put our names in and win the money as well. Life isn't <laughs> like that. Um, you have to start from the roots upward and develop your markets, your knowledge. I mean, yes, it's good to see um, examples and the document that uh, Shema referred to does do that, but it's no easy fix. You know, you can't take a successful proposal and slot the names in. Um, the, the other thing too is we get the comment that we submitted to the commission. Uh, we got a, a score of 13 or something. Uh, we improved it, submitted again. I've got a lower score. How can this happen? It happens because you're going to different evaluators. There's a little bit of variance, but the commission are very careful to try and take out any differences in evaluation. The main reason is that each time you're in a different competition. So the first time around, you may not have had much competition for funding. The second time around, it may be a lot keener. So although your proposal is probably better, in comparison to others, it's worse. So each time is a new competition, And, um, you know, some companies submit three, four, five times um, and then are successful. The other point to take on board about that is that um, if you um, are submitting uh, a number of times on proposals, um, that the uh, innovation that you're saying is world beating and so forth may not be. It may, may, may be that you will never win funding because the idea, the project, the innovation is not disruptive enough. Um, so it's, it's a harsh world, uh, but it can be just that. And simply repeating the application doesn't guarantee that eventually you'll win. I think we've probably now reached the end of the transmission. The webinar will remain open for the next half hour or so for 
questions. Um, I'm sorry for some of the technical glitches earlier on. It happens. Uh, we're not up to KRT B of standards yet, but I'm sure uh, eventually by the end of webinar nine, we may be getting there. But thank you for listening. We've had over 60 people listening into us and watching us this morning uh, and a number of questions. Uh, for the last time I'll say, the webinar will be on our website and we will also publish the questions so that everyone can have a look at them. So it's good it's goodbye from me, it's goodbye from Shema, yes. and then we'll hand over to Yasmin. Goodbye from Shema. Yasmin. Uh, hi, hi again. Uh, I hope you found our webinar useful. Uh, as I said earlier, all uh, presentations, reports, and uh, all other useful information will be provided on our website, which is Turkey in H2020.eu. Also, you can find very useful information on TUDAC's uh, website, uh, which is www.h2020.org.cr. Uh, the next webinar will be held on 28th of November, and we will try to cover another interesting topic for you. You will be notified about uh, the uh, webinar topic and the registration details later. And uh, as Philip mentioned, uh, this platform will be open for questions I think until 12 o'clock. So even if you don't respond to them now, uh, all the answers will be provided in our website. So please don't hesitate to ask all your questions, either in English and Turkish. And we are looking forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you for having joined us. Thank you. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.